All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, so today I'll be giving you an overview of how to analyze shotgun metagenomic sequencing data in general. And I'm gonna focus in on a few specific tools. But I'm also trying to give you, gonna to attempt to give you the lay of the land a little bit, just because I know from experience, as soon as you start trying to analyze this kind of data, you start Googling, how should I, what tools should I use for working on metagenomics? You just instantly come across like 50 different tools they all claim to be better than the last. It's very confusing. It's hard to know what to use. So I'm going to try to tell you about the major classes of these tools, uh, the most popular ones out there, and then I'll try to emphasize some of the caveats of them. So the main learning objectives of this lecture will be, again, to introduce the pros and cons of using shock imaginomics data in general, as well as the tools, um, become familiar with the major approaches to, the, uh, to profile the taxa, so taxonomically profile, so who's there, in the community, as well as understanding the difference between functional and taxonomic data types. So I'll go over the somewhat subtle difference between these data types. Um, and then I'll focus in a bit more detail on the HUMAN2 pipeline, but I'll also focus on a few other examples as well. OK, so as we learned yesterday, uh, the two main approaches for profile in the microbiome are 6 ns rRNA gene sequencing. So this is when you have uh, essentially a barcode of who's there in your community, uh, you're able to amplify out this, these variable regions, which tell you which genera and which species are present. Typically, don't have more resolution than that to go lower. Uh, but with the noising methods, you can get theoretically biological sequences. So you can, in some cases, discern uh, strain level. And then using tools like PyCrest, you can get the predicted community, uh, functional potential, potential. So basically, OK, so I know which taxa are here. And by, as you know, when I say taxa, that's just a general term for what microbes are there. So it's just, it could refer to what species or which genera are there. It's just the general term people use. Uh, and so, so based on that information, what are they likely doing? What functions are they probably doing? In contrast, shock imaginomics is this case on the right here, where um, essentially, you can imagine we have this one sample of lots of different microbes. If you know, see this little differently covered genomes here. Essentially, these genomes are just all chopped up and uh, indiscriminately, they're all, all the DNA is sequenced. So importantly, the, uh, this approach doesn't know where the DNA came from. So there could be human DNA there, could be other contaminants. So it's uh, much less specific than 6NS sequencing, but you get a lot more information about, for instance, what strains are there, because you can actually get strain level genes and you can identify that more easily. But as we'll talk about, the complexity of analyzing this data is it's, it's essentially a lot harder, as you can imagine, since you're not just looking at one gene, you're looking at essentially all the genes in the community. And so directly you can get what the community's functional potential is, rather than having to infer it. <clears throat> so uh, the major pros of 6NS sequence, sequencing are, number one, that it's well established. So uh, although, you know, Chang 2 might, some people, you know, might be a little struggle to learn at first, maybe a little learning curve, but once you just get it established, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it's well documented. It's, it's been published many times. At least Chime One has. And so there's a lot. There's a wealth of literature out there that can help you work with 6NS. Shock metagenomics is a bit more of the wild west right now. It's it's really improved in the last couple of years, but the tools are really just now starting to come out. <clears throat> um, so the major advantage of 6NS again is that it's a lot cheaper, as you can imagine, since for each sample you only need about 50,000 reads. Uh, and so we'll talk about in a second how you need a lot more for shock imaginomics. Again, it only amplifies what you want. So uh, since the 6NS gene isn't in humans, for instance, you won't get very much human contamination, at least, in your 6NS data. And so this is a major problem if you're working with shock imaginomics from bio human biopsy samples, for instance. You can get something like 99.9% .9 in some cases human DNA. And so you really have to be aware of that. Uh, so a major con of 6NS sequencing is that how, what primaries you choose can really affect your results and what variable region you look at. So Will was talking about that a little bit yesterday. So for instance, uh, you can identify archaea with the standard V3 or V4 or V5 primers, um, but tip, it don't, they don't amplify as well as a lot of bacterial clades that are commensals in the human gut. And so you might be missing a lot of, if you're interested in archaea specifically, you might want to choose a different primer set. Uh, so there's, there's a few different primers that have been uh, basically tested out for different clades of interest. Uh, 
Uh, and then again, you don't usually have enough resolution to identify down at the strain level, since even sometimes, in some cases, species within a genus even will have identical 6 and S sequences, so you won't be able to see anything lower than that. And again, any clade like virus which doesn't contain the 6 and S, you won't have any information on that. And of course, it doesn't provide direct functional profiling again. So shock and genomics doesn't have this primer bias. It allows you to identify all the microbes there. So if you're interested in viruses and eukaryotes, you'll get that information along with the bacterial data. And it allows direct functional profiling of your data. So again, since you're sequencing everything, if you have a read that maps to a gene, you can at least get some sort of confidence value on how likely it is that a, ho a homolog or something similar to that gene is present. So it's a very different approach than 6 and S. So uh, the downside is that it's a lot more expensive. So for one sample, typically you need something like, like 15 million reads rather than 50,000 for one sample of 6 and S. So that would be a, a good sampling depth. Uh, so that obviously, uh, it depends what information, like for your own study, whether using 6 and S just to get the tax that would be more worthwhile, or whether you really want to invest uh, to get the functional profiling data from shock image genomics. So something to be considered carefully. Uh, and so like I mentioned, this host site contamination can be really significant from shock image genomics data. Uh, also, because you're sequencing everything, that means that uh, if there's some abundant microbes, very large genomes, uh, you might be oversampling those. And if there are some rare genomes out there, you might not have a lot of information on those. And so in contrast, if you're just amplifying the 16S, it's a lot easier to get an idea of, okay, what are all the variants of the 16S out there? Whereas with shock command genomics, you, some, depending on the complexity of your community, you might need a lot higher depth. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, and lastly, what's often overlooked is that if you're dealing with shock command genomics, typically the computational res resource is required or, or more restrictive. So you typically need more memory. And in some cases, you might need more computing power. Otherwise, your jobs might take a couple days to run. And then the actual underlying bioinformatic analyses tend to be uh, more sophisticated. So something to keep in mind uh, is basically whenever we're talking about uh, metagenomic or 6 s amplification, that we're talking about DNA sequencing. And so just because you can identify that taxa is present, that doesn't mean that it's active necessarily or even that it's alive. So similar to this is that when you were looking at functional profiling using these data types, it's important to keep in mind that this is functional potential. So it's what could potentially be expressed. And so this is a level away from the transcriptome, um, which you're going to be learning about tomorrow morning, I think. Yes. So uh, there, people have looked at this a little bit. So um, generally, on average, there's good concordance between uh, the abundance of the genes identified based on metagenomic approaches and the relative abundance of uh, the mRNA from the same genes based on metatranscriptomics. So you can see here uh, reported Spearman's row value of 0 0.76. So on average, it seems to be pretty highly concordant, but there are a lot of major exceptions. So for instance, if you're interested in genes evolved in methanogenesis, they tend to be very highly expressed, even if they're only present in a few copies. The same for antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, and then in contrast, sporulation genes might be widely dispersed, but then in most contexts, they might not need to be expressed. So uh, it's important to just interpret the data correctly. So this is DNA data. Just because it's there doesn't mean that it's being used. Uh, so generally, when you're working on next generation sequencing data, a really important step is pre-processing. So for the 6 and S as well, it's important to think about how to filter your reads. But especially for shock image genomics, this comes up. Uh, and so we uh, will refer to yesterday how, especially as you go along the read near the end, the quality scores will drop off. And so the main way that quality score is measured is this FRED quality score here. So you'll see these Q values. And so if you looked in the FASTQ file yesterday, you would have seen all those weird characters in one of the lines that was, it would just be alphanumeric. So there could be like exclamation points and, you know, a capital Z. And that those would have different meanings for what quality each base in the read was. And so when you're looking at the box plots of the quality, that's what was being plotted. And so essentially what it's showing is the p-value of that base being an error. So that's, that's how that should be interpreted. And so the higher the value, the, more, the less likely it is an error. And so based on this score, people typically will trim back reads from the end. So there's a tool called Trimomatic, which is quite popular, but there's a few others out there as well. Uh, so this is an important step when you're, step when you're analyzing your data. 
and it's you know it can be boring, but uh, it's really important to keep track of your options and think about them carefully because for reproducibility, if someone was were to process the data differently, they might get uh, different downstream results. So it's really important to think about this. Uh, so a similar preprocessing step is to identify contaminant reads. Uh, so again, this comes up a lot with human and mouse DNA uh, in medical microbiome studies. Uh, so typically what, I think we'll again refer to this, but typically uh, the reads would be mapped to a host reference genome. So we know the human genome, we can take reads from our samples, see if they align anywhere in the genome. Um, and it's, it's important to keep in mind that usually when people are mapping reads to a genome, it's for something like SNP calling. So we want to identify mutations in the human, human populations, for instance. Uh, so here, the actual, we might want to be more lenient in how we're mapping the reads. So you might want to change the options so that even if a read just maps okay to the genome, you still want to throw it out because you want to be conservative. So it's important to think about that. So you might just not want to use BWA the way you'd always use it, used it in the past. You might want to use it in a more lenient way. I uh, also wanted to mention that uh, PhiX, this microvirus, which was the first genome sequenced, is a very common sequencing control. And so essentially, especially in Illumina sequencers, this virus will be, the viral genome will be sequenced re uh, repetitively, uh, so again and again, and um, the reads will be mapped, mapped back to the genome. And how well the reads map give feedback to the sequencer on the quality of the sequence, sequences. And so these reads should be removed usually by the Illumina sequencer before you get your data, um, but not always. So some of these reads can get through. And so it's just important to keep in mind because actually uh, PhiX is in the human gut. So if you're studying the human gut especially, you have to, have to watch out for it. So I'm just going to talk about taxonomic profiling now. So now that we have our data, we processed it, how do we figure out who's there in the community? So again, I'm talking about this problem here. So we have each, each black line here represents a read. So it's a string of these nucleotides here. How do we go from this data into something like this? So we know, OK, based on this complex, the uh, different abundance of these reads, these taxon, taxa have these relative abundances. So the two major classes for doing this of shock imagenomics data are marker and binning approaches. So I'm going to go into a little more detail on both of these approaches and focus on one marker, one, one tool from each of these classes. So um, some of the downsides of both of these approaches are that for binning, essentially you're taking all the reads and you're trying to put, group them together uh, before you classify them. So again, you have to remember that we don't know uh, before we start analyzing the data how many organisms there are, usually. Uh, we don't know uh, how they're expected to cluster together. So this is an attempt to basically figure out how the reads group together. Uh, and so there's two major uh, subclasses of that. But because often it relies on a similarity search, it can be a lot more computationally intensive than the other approaches I'll talk about. And uh, although there's something um, appealing about just taking your reads and uh, aligning it to a reference genome, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the reference genomes aren't perfect. There's lateral gene transfer. And many, many microbes are mis don't have reference genomes. And many strains don't have reference genomes. So it's, Important to keep that in mind. I'll mention that more in a second. Uh, marker gene approaches, in contrast, are essentially approaches that try to use either a single, well-conserved gene, like the 16S, or clade-specific marker genes that can actually allow you to identify essentially the same idea as 16S, where you have a barcode for a particular lineage, which you can identify using your shock imaginomics um, data. Uh, so again, since you're only looking at ind individual marker genes, this doesn't tell you about the other genes in those genomes. Um, and if you're just using this approach, you wouldn't be able to do assembly as well. Uh, and it's highly dependent on your choice of markers since um, different lineages can have different biases. And depending on the environment you're looking at, the marker genes, clade specific marker genes, might not be well, very well documented. <clears throat> so if we're looking at binning approaches specifically, the two major subclasses are composition based and sequence based. Uh, so composition based. Are, tend to be a lot faster. So essentially, they look at the reads and they try to calculate some usually pretty basic metric um, and then try to just group them together based on that metric. And so, for instance, they might look at uh, tetranucleotide composition so some, or GC content, so something about how common each nucleotide is in the reads, which should correspond to hopefully a similar clade, sometimes a similar species, the same species, hopefully. Um, 
So that's the idea of that. So again, using these, these metrics calculated from the reads themselves. And in contrast, the sequence based is or more of what I was referring to before. So taking your reads and blasting them or somehow doing a similarity search against a large database of genomes. And then saying, OK, so it, it mapped to a few of these genomes here. I know what species those correspond to. So I'm going to take a best guess or a conservative guess of what species those reads correspond to. So uh, two major approaches are to say the best hit. So if your read maps to three different genomes, but it mapped really well to one, you might say, OK, I'm, I'm just going to assume that that's the genome. Or you could say, OK, it mapped to three species in this genus, so I'm going to say that it's, it corresponds to this genus. So that would be the lowest common ancestor approach. So again, that's a basic example that is shown here. So you can imagine if the check marks corresponded to a read aligning, the X's correspond to it not mapping. Uh, we'd have a case here where a read mapped to E. coli and Salmonella and Enterica, but not to the other species in each of these genera, and not to the outgroup species uh, Pseudomonas. Then we might say, okay, so it's in both of these genera, so I'll say that it's in the I'll go to the lowest common ancestor and Terobacteriaceae family of both of these, gen these genera. And so that would be how that approach works. So there's a few different uh, lowest common ancestor tools out there that will take in your shock and genomics data and use this approach by line to databases to output the taxonomic profiles. So uh, Megan is one of the uh, first genomic tools that was published. Actually, it's still going strong. It's being really, it's very well maintained. Updates are coming out all the, all the time. So uh, it actually has a great GUI interface. Uh, and the great thing about Megan is that not only does it do taxonomic profiling, it also does uh, functional profiling as well. Uh, and it really has some nice visual, visualization. So I don't think we'll be talking about Megan in any of the labs. But if you're working with this type of data, I'd encourage you to download it and just at least try out some of the visualizations because it, it could be useful. Uh, MGRAST is definitely another one to be aware of. Uh, it's, again, an older approach, and it's web-based. So uh, running it can take a while. So it's appealing because it should be easier because it's on the web. However, it's known for having much lower accuracy than the other approaches. So uh, I wouldn't encourage you to use MGRAST. Uh, and lastly, Kraken is more of a, a newer approach um, that is kind of described usually as the fastest approach to, to date, which I believe is still correct. And uh, so I think originally I wrote highly accurate, so it's highly precise for sure. Uh, so by that I mean of the things it calls, uh, the vast majority of them, they tend to be mainly correct. But uh, I, compared to the other approaches, the sensitivity can be a little lower. Um, and so actually Megan tends to have very high precision. Uh, but I, Kraken and Megan, they both tend to be quite similar in, in their, their accuracy overall. And as I'll talk about in a second, all these approaches tends to, tend to be much more sensitive than the marker gene approaches, which I think will become clear when I describe it more and also in the lab as well. So I'm going to try to contrast the two major approaches. And then Laura is going to go into a lot more detail in uh, assembly and binning approaches. So I'll try not to uh, duplicate efforts here. So uh, I think Laura is going to talk about centrifuge a bit. So it's, um, it's an approach written by the, uh, the same authors as Kraken, or at least some of the same authors. Uh, so it's a similar algorithm. It's still fast, but it's about only, uh, it's about twice as, it's only half as fast now compared to Kraken. But the real benefit of it is that it uses about four gigabytes of RAM. So Kraken, I didn't actually point this out, but the real downside is that it, used, it requires 124 gigabytes of RAM or something in that range. So for most people, they just can't, they can't work that. So that's one reason why it really hasn't been accepted by the field. But centrifuge doesn't have this problem. And as you'll see today, it still runs in a very reasonable amount of time, at least on the test data set. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind, although I won't be emphasizing this tool too much, that it does have a much higher sensitivity than the marker-based approaches. So uh, again, I just want to emphasize, for your own data, you have to think about, uh, for, for your questions, which approach, what caveats you'd like to accept. Because at some point, you just have to basically accept the problems of each of the tools and just go of what's best for your question, because none of them are perfect. Uh, so uh, again, I think Laura's going to go over this. Oh, no? OK, sorry. I think I, I saw it in someone's slides. Um, so, so essentially, uh, one reason why centrifuge and Kraken are faster are because they're able to compress the genomes together. Uh, so by that, all I mean is that 
So if you have three different reference genomes here, you don't have to basically duplicate effort when you're mapping the reads. So the, the program in advance will say, okay, these sequences from these genomes are identical, so why would I bother mapping the same the read to this identical sequence in two different genomes? It just keeps track of, okay, this stretch of base pair is the same in both of these genomes. I'll just remember that. And then it just doesn't, it doesn't bother dupl uh, replicating those sequences. It just compresses them down and then only does the mapping once. And so that's the idea here. So you'd end up with sort of much compressed genome that you'd be mapping to, and then you just keep track of what parts of that compressed genome correspond to which genomes and which are unique to individual genomes. So that's sort of the major reason why this is a faster approach. Uh, so the very basic overview of this uh, classification approach is that it really does do a similarity search against this compressed genome database. Uh, it matches input reads 16 base pairs at a time, and then uh, it tries to extend it as much as possible. And then there's some, uh, the thing about this tool is that there's lots of options you could uh, tweak, um, although it's, it's difficult to know without doing a lot of testing how it would affect your results. But essentially, they, uh, by default, they'll try to extend it to 22 base pairs. And if they get that far, then they'll say, okay, I'm going to say that that's a match. And then it'll give you a score based on how well it matched. Uh, and then often what it does is the same read will map to lots of different genomes in this database. And then it'll say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll output the five most likely uh, taxa that that read corresponds to. So it doesn't actually, it uses lowest common ancestor to prune down to those five taxa but not, uh, it doesn't just prune down to one, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> so uh, in the lab, uh, this tool will briefly, you'll, you'll briefly be running this tool essentially, and so the key thing will just be to think about um, how different this output would be than if you use Metaflame 2, which I'll talk about now. So, uh, so that, those were these binning approaches for doing the taxonomic profiling. Uh, so in contrast, there's uh, two major subclasses of marker gene approaches. So again, these are approaches which, in the, the simplest case, just would use a single gene like the 16S. So you, you can just only, you can map your reads to a database of 16S sequences and just retain those reads. And you could essentially use Chime 2. You can do that. Um, you could do that for another universal uh, single copy gene as well, like a universal genes such as uh, chaperone in 60. Uh, or a host of others that might be more clade specific. Um, so again, technically you could do that. It's not, people don't uh, typically do that, but that, that's sort of uh, the origin of these marker gene approaches. And then in recent years, there's been development of, of tools that either use several universal genes at once, so that would be file sift. So essentially that has a database of 37 universal single copy genes, and then the reads are mapped to all those genes. And then depending on uh, basically the barcode for each of those universals, so they should be in the majority of bacteria, so they might be missing in 5% or something. So based on how well the reads map to each of those, basically you have 37 different barcodes and you have a pretty good idea of which clade that corresponds to, or at least the relative abundance of those clades. Uh, and so a different approach is actually to not just use these universal single copy genes, uh, but to actually figure out for individual lineages, so at the genus level, at the family level, what genes are sort of um, only found in that lineage and are found in everything within that lineage. So I'll explain that again in a second. So again, uh, Metaflan 2 uses this approach. So it's, these are called clade-specific marker, gene markers. Uh, so this data, Metaflan 2, at least last time I looked, it had about a million markers from 17,000 genomes, so mainly bacterial, you can see here. And this can technically allow you to identify down to the strain level, although Usually it's something like species or genus because there's, it's difficult to say with confidence that there's a specific gene that's only found in a strain. So there's not, the number of marker genes for strains is much smaller than for species, for instance. Uh, and so the real advantage of this is that because you're just mapping to this relatively small database of clade-specific marker genes, it's pretty fast to do that similarity search. And, you know, one strength is that you, most, you know that most of the reads won't align, so it, it can be done very quickly. So that's also the downside, because you might only be using something like 2% of your reads, and so you're, if you're just using tax, if you're just getting taxonomic profiling from your managed genomics data, you'd be throwing out a large proportion of your data. So um, you might be getting really, what, 
probably uh, very good estimates of what tax are there based on what's in the database. But again, you could be missing a lot using this approach. So just to highlight again what, what clade-specific marker genes are, so uh, a core gene is defined as something that's found in everything, all the genomes of inner lineage. So in this clade Y here, you can see that uh, all the tips of this tree, which correspond uh, to different genomes, they all have this core gene in red. But uh, just the definition here is that since it's a core gene, it doesn't mean that it can't be found elsewhere in the tree. So this tool specifically looks for core genes that are unique to a clade. And so it's this kind of gene that's a clade-specific marker gene, um, which is used to identify the relative abundance of individual lineages. So uh, the general big picture pipeline for Metaflan 2 is that uh, in advance, this section, the chocoflan section, is basically done offline by the authors of Metaflan 2. So essentially they have, they take these FASTAs, these are just the raw sequence of each genome, they plug it through their pipeline, so they have annotations of all the genes. They want to figure out, okay, uh, how well, which which of these genes are found in all of the all of the uh, the genomes of in a certain lineage, and then which of these core genes are actually unique marker genes, and then so the problem there is then um, to figure out what sequence is the most representative because you could have something like a hundred different versions of the same homologous gene, and so they have to choose something like the centroid or some other approach to figure out what's the most representative. Uh, so they describe that more in, the, in their paper, if you're interested. But essentially, what they get in the output is uh, one representative sequence for each of these clade-specific marker genes, which then you can map your reads to using their Metaflan pipeline. So again, uh, so they use a BLAST approach against this database of marker genes. And then so it's important to keep in mind that a single lineage might have a couple different or sometimes quite a few different marker genes for a given clade. And so it's not trivial to figure out, based on how many reads map to all these different marker genes, what the abundance of that clade should be. So they internally, they figure out uh, that normalization. And so they'll output a relative abundance for each of these, um, each, each of the taxa that had clade-specific marker genes that were positively hit. Um, so again, so it's important to keep in mind that Metaflam will only output the relative abundance data and so um, I think Rob will be talking more about the compositionality of microbiome data and how you can actually use the counts of reads uh, directly rather than converting just to relative abundances. Uh, and so you lose that information of Metaflan too. So that's, yeah. Do you have only one core gene per clade or do you have multiple core genes per clade? Uh, it's actually as many as they can do. So sometimes. Some, I, I'm not sure of the distribution, but sometimes it's one, sometimes there are quite a few. So as long as they're confident it's a core unique gene, they'll use it. Uh, so again, why would you use this approach given the caveats I mentioned? Well, a lot of people use it because it's really fast and honestly it's very easy. Um, and also it pro provides basic way to get information about all the different kingdoms very, uh, very straight, in a very straightforward way. Uh, and in general, especially for human microbiome data, it's quite well accepted by the field uh, as sort of like if you're just getting taxonomy, you can get a quite a robust estimate. Uh, so again, the major thing you have to think about is you're going to be throwing out a large proportion of your data if you use this approach. So uh, yeah, you'll see a pretty stark difference when we look at the centrifuge output in the lab. <clears throat> so um, the actual, like I mentioned before, uh, the Metaflan 2 pipeline will do a similarity search. That is actually down at Bowtie 2. So it's a nucleotide v nucleotide similarity search against the marker gene database. Uh, so Metaflan 2 and also Human 2, which I'll be talking about in a second, both of these approaches can use paired in data. So the forward and reverse reads. But it's important to keep in mind that if you do input, it, it might seem like you can input your forward and reverse reads independently. And so, you know, that seems really good because. Obviously, if a forward read maps here, you want to be able to use that information to inform, to help their reverse read maps. So you, could, you should be able to get higher quality mappings. But it's important to know it doesn't actually do that. So it actually concatenates them together. So the forward and reverse, so it literally concatenates the two files together, essentially. So the forward and reverse reads will be mapped independently. Uh, and so this overall, this doesn't really affect the result, given that if you're dealing with millions of reads. But it's just, uh, just something to be aware of, that it's 
that's how it's treating that paired end data. Um, so also to keep in mind is that if you're using this pipeline, each sample is processed individually, and then you have to combine them the last step. So in the lab, um, I introduced this tool called uh, GNU Parallel, which essentially allows you to run the same command on a bunch of different files, you know, hopefully a straightforward way. So again, using approaches like that or some other way to loop over all your files is required if you want to use Metaflame 2. So we'll go over that in the lab. Uh, so in another actually maybe overlooked uh, plus of Metaflame 2 is that uh, it's produced by the Huttenhauer Lab, which is this, uh, they, they develop a lot of different tools. And so it's actually pretty easy to plug and play with the Metaflame 2 output with a lot of their other tools as well. So I'll be highlighting Strainflame, which is a great tool if you're interested in uh, profiling strain variation. So a lot of people are starting to turn towards taking shock imagenomics data to actually track strains either over time or between different individuals. And so uh, why would we care about this? Well, it's been well established that, for instance, this class, somewhat classic paper, I guess only 20, 2008, but classic to me, that uh, based on 17 E. coli genomes, uh, so they had a core genome of about 2,000 genes, and then just even just based on 17 E. coli genomes, I, I know that I think there's certainly over 100 genome sequence now from E. coli. Uh, so even just based on those 17, uh, there are about 13,000 accessory genes. So just by knowing that E. coli is present in your sample, you might be missing a lot of the really interesting functions that are actually biologically important in your data. And just knowing the species and knowing the core genes isn't telling you much. And so actually knowing the specific strain and maybe tracking that between individuals, uh, it can definitely allow you to tell how the communities are changing over time. So for instance, is it something about E. coli species in general that allows them to be established in an environment or is it a strain-specific adaptation, perhaps? And uh, similar to that is the idea that if you can actually show that it's a particular strain of an organism uh, associated with a phenotype of interest, it might allow you to have more reason to believe there's a causal role or at least some sort of uh, particular gene you could actually narrow in on further for that particular strain. So there's, there's a lot of motivation for getting down at the strain level. And so essentially, although I, I mentioned that Metaflame 2 can output particular strain abundances, usually that's hard because there's not too many uh, strain-specific marker genes. Um, so instead, what it does is it, for uh, your clade of interest, usually a species, uh, it'll take all the marker genes uh, and essentially it'll take the mapped reads to those marker genes and it'll make consensus sequences for them. So it'll essentially figure out, okay, where are the mutations in these marker genes? Uh, and then, so essentially trying to distinguish the different strain variation in, on the mutations in the reads that, that were mapped. And then uh, essentially based on this consensus sequence, different strains are identified in your samples. And so that can allow you, as we'll see, to just pinpoint the uh, phylogenetic relatedness of the different strains. So that can be useful if you're trying to see if at least a different clustering of a, of a particular species are, with, are associated with one um, response of interest. So, we'll be looking at uh, Crohn, trying to ask whether non-IBD and Crohn's disease patients have uh, particular uh, different strains of a bacteroides species. And so that, that would be one, um, one application of this approach that we'll explore. So uh, like I hinted at before, this is basically a general slide about microbiome data, but it's especially true for Metaflan 2 output. Uh, but essentially, when we're talking about sequencing data, it's wrong to think about it in terms of absolute abundance. So, you know, if you're talking about actual cell counts, biomass, that would be the absolute abundance. If you're talking about reads, this is compositional data. And so if you literally did more sequencing, you'd get more reads. That doesn't mean that there's more microbes in the data. And so this might seem kind of like a trivial difference, but it does make a difference when you're trying to explain this in scientific papers. It can be very misleading if you're talking about there's more of this microbe than that one in between samples. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. So really, you have to keep in mind that you're dealing with relative abundance data. So you can imagine if there's a case where one sample had a trillion cells, one sample had a million cells, and then you found that, you know, ter in terms of relative abundance, there was five times more E. coli in this, in this sample of only a million cells. But it would be wrong to say that there was more E. coli in that community because little did you know that it had so many fewer cells. So again, it's just important to keep that in mind, especially if you're wording 
uh, how to how you heard describing this data in scientific uh, reports. Uh, so, like I said, this is especially true for Metaflan two since it'll only output uh, the relative abundance, so essentially uh, the percent of each taxonomic abundance per sample. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to move on now to functional composition. So this is basically just going to introduce what this means. So it's related to the pie crest output we were looking at yesterday, uh, and just I'll be uh, comparing this with the taxonomic profiles that I was just describing. So uh, essentially function is a very broad term uh, in the microbiome field. So when we talk about functions, we might mean very general categories like uh, higher pathways or even something like photosynthesis uh, or even something down lower at specific gene families which tend to be shared across multiple organisms. So yesterday we were looking at enzyme classification numbers, so specific reactions in pathways. But there's uh, different ways of making gene families as well. So there's keg orthologs, and uh, I'll describe a couple others in a, in a second. So um, here are some really well-known functional databases. So COG is uh, an older one, but um, was widely used, especially a few years ago. So it stands for clusters of orthologous groups. Um, uh, PFAM is a database based mainly on protein domains, uh, based on hidden Markov models of um, the amino acid codes within different uh, domains of proteins. And KEG stands for Kyoto, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. So this was probably the most popular functional database and might still be. Um, so each event, uh, it, um, at the start it was based on enzyme classification numbers, uh, but now it's branched out to be just based on orthologs in general. Um, so it's very well annotated and it pr provides pretty easy ways to get modules and pathways, so higher level functions. But the real catch is that now it requires a license fee. So a lot of researchers are using a really old KEG database from something like 2013 or something. So instead of using KEG, because a lot of uh, academics don't want to pay the expensive license fee, we're starting to move to MetaPsych. Uh, so it's a database that's similar to KEG, but more microbe focused overall. Uh, and uh, so that was the pathways that were produced by PyCRS2 yesterday in the tutorial. And uh, also Uniref is sort of this, it's been around for a while, but it's a, sort of a different approach than the others I've described. So there's different, you can just take totally different uh, perspectives on how to define gene families. You could either say, okay, these, the genes, the similarities genes might, based on the sequence, might not be great, but they have the same role in this pathway. They do the same reaction. So I'm going to say that they're the same gene family. For Uniref is literally just taking all the known proteins and just clustering them all together. So either at 100, 90, or 50 percent, and then saying, okay, the sequences that cluster together, that's a gene family. So that's this approach. There's, as you'll see, there's a pretty stark difference between how, you, if you define function based on this database, you'd get a very different conclusion than if you use something like KEG. So it's definitely the most comprehensive. So you definitely get the most information. Uh, but the downside is that the vast majority of these gene families are they're really protein families because they're based on protein sequences. Um, they're not they're not in it. They don't we don't know what they do. They're uncharacterized. So essentially, you'd have millions of proteins. You don't know what they do, uh, and so it, it could it could still be informative if it's highly associated with your phenotype or trait of interest, but response of interest. But um, just based on bioinformatic analyses, you won't know what it's doing. Uh, so. This is definitely a sort of a major observation that's been made that you should be aware of. Um, so essentially when people have been looking at tax taxonomic and functional profiles from this sort of data, this is basically a normal result. So this is from the Human Microbiome Project from Tong Dorsum and stool samples. This is a stacked bar chart. So essentially uh, all of the uh, different colors here referred on the left hand side refer to different phyla. And uh, the x-axis correspond to different individual samples. And so essentially, the big yellow bar here means that this, phyla, this phylum is at high abundance within this last sample here. Uh, and so you can see that you know, it tends to be highly variable across both body sites. And then these are the same samples across both these body sites, but based on, uh, I believe it's keg pathways in this example. And so you can see that it looks like it's extremely highly conserved. So this has sort of prompted people to say, well, maybe we shouldn't care about tax. I mean, it, like, why would we anyway? We, why would it matter what, we, what label we're saying with the relative abundance of these labels? Doesn't just matter what's actually being done in the, in the community. 
So at some point that that has to be true. I mean, these are if we're just talking about taxonomy, we are just talking about names at some point. And so really we're talking about functions that are supposed to be linked to those names at, at some level. And so that's, if we're defining function correctly, this really should be what we're more interested in. The problem is that even when you're annotating functions, you might be leaving 50 to 75% of your reads unassigned. So a lot of these functions are probably very highly, highly conserved. And so it may not be that surprising if they're highly stable. You might be missing a lot of the functions that are more individual specific. Um, and also, some have said that it's actually just incorrect to talk about variance across these two data types just because they are so different. So the amount of meaningful variation here might be very different than for taxonomy. That's, that's more controversial. And uh, again, as I'll point out right now, um, this de how stable this is depends a lot about how you're defining what a function is. So uh, just to hammer this home, um, if we look at functional variability, variability measured by break Curtis dissimilarity between pairwise samples. So you can basically think of these box plots saying how similar are, um, are in this case, this is human stool samples, but how similar are, are samples based on each of these different data types, whether we're talking about different levels of taxonomy or if we're talking about functional levels here. So this is essentially the same thing I was just showing you before. So if you're looking at strain level or even the phylum level, it tends to be more variable across samples than if you're looking at, oh, I gave it away. Than if you're looking at uh, keg orthologs or even keg pathways, or sorry, keg pathways, especially because they're high level, and even keg orthologs, just there's some, it could be thousands of these keg orthologs, but overall they tend to be more similar across samples than taxonomy. But if we defined our function based on the Uniref database, we would see much more uh, dissimilarity across the samples. And again, so this is based on these, these protein clusters. So it's important to keep in mind. Just, just be aware of what database you're using, essentially. So depending on this choice, you will get a very different output. And just again, just to highlight the difference between these, these are pretty stark examples. So there's, there, there are lots of examples in between these databases, but these are sort of the extremes. Uh, so for, on, the, on the left here is the mean number of species that possess either a, one of these uh, gene or protein families or higher functions. So so for each of these functions in these, in these different databases here, how many species have them on average? So essentially, most Uniref 100 protein sequences are only found in one species. Might not be surprising. But even if you go down to Uniref 50, so this is uh, clustering protein sequences at 50% identity, you really only have about three species on average that possess that, that protein. So that might be, I, I was surprised when I first came across that, so I think it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind. I would have, I would have initially thought that this would be more widely dispersed than even keg orthologs, but this is not true at all. So the keg orthologs, in contrast, tend to be widely dispersed functions that are widely shared, which, in hindsight, makes sense because that's how they're defined. They, it's hard to, um, for the most part, these are functions that have been seen again and again, and that's why, uh, because researchers have been interested in them in a few different model organisms, for instance. Uh, so that, and that's largely the framework that these have been defined in. Uh, and so this is also shown not only in the mean number of species that have these functions, but also how many entries there are in each of these databases. So you can see, yeah, there's almost 70 million at least at the time of publication here in Uniref 100, whereas we're talking about 400 pathways in the keg database. So again, it's, these, are very, these are both functions, but they're very, very different interpretations of the output. Uh, so there's a few different approaches to annotate, annotate uh, the uh, metagenomic data to get functional profiles. So there's some web-based approaches here. Uh, so like I mentioned, MGRAFT is uh, an older approach that's online. Um, and so these, uh, and EBI, metagenomics, uh, the Integrated Microbial Genomes Database. Uh, so Megan, again, has some great uh, visualizations. It has a graphical user interface. So uh, that could be, could be useful if you're trying to process this data. And there's a few local based approaches as well. Uh, so these, uh, I'm going to be focusing on Human 2. So you, you may have heard about Human in the past. So in the last couple of years, people have been moving to the second version of this tool. And the real plus of this approach is that it provides links between function and taxa. So, um, you know, we're talking about which, which of these fancy tools to use. And some, someone might be asking, well, why do I have to bother? Why can't I just take all my reads? and just do a similarity search against all the known proteins or all the known DNA sequences that are out there and just figure it out myself. Like, it can't be that hard. 
Well, the first problem is that if you're just doing Blast, you'd be really slow. And so you'll come across this tool called Diamond, which was published a few years ago. Um, it's uh, a couple of orders of magnitude faster than Blast for a very slight cost of accuracy. Uh, so that would be your first fault. Uh, and then also, if you're just doing Blast to lots of different, all the known proteins out there, uh, you know, it's, it's not trivial to say, okay, I these very similar hits for the same sequence against this database. So what gene would I call, would I say that this read maps to? So uh, it's not trivial to actually figure that out. Um, you also have to account for these genes have different lengths. So longer reads are more likely to be hit by reads. Uh, sorry, longer genes are more likely to be hit by the reads when you're mapping. So you'd have to account for that as well. Uh, also, if you're talking about higher level pathways or modules, um, again, the sequencing depth might be missing a lot of the important genes, which would be important reactions in that pathway. And so you'd have to think about how to fill in the gaps to get them basically the, the best guess of what pathways are present in your community. Uh, and so this is related to this last approach here, which, you know, it's, you have to use some existing tools to actually infer the pathway or module abundances based on the gene families you inferred. So, uh, yeah, the, these, essentially these are some of the major reasons why you'd want to use uh, HUMAN2. So HUMAN2 uh, has been described as a tiered read mapping approach. Uh, so what I mean by that is essentially start out with your input sequences here. So that, again, these are the input reads. Uh, and here it's been this kind of spoiler has been given away. We know that we wouldn't normally know this, but in this case, we know that uh, light blue corresponds to one species. This corresponds to another species. Uh, some of the reads might ambiguously map to multiple species. And then some of them might be totally novel. We have the species never been seen before. It's not in the database. So there's, given the existing methods, we're not going to know, uh, at least based on read mapping, which, what species it corresponds to. So the first step of HUMAN2 is to do a taxonomic prescreen of Metaflan2. So it'll use these clade-specific marker genes uh, and map the reads against them to basically figure out, OK, what, um, what genomes can I expect to be in my sample? So uh, if Basically, if a clade-specific marker gene is positive, it'll say, OK, I have some genomes from that clade. So actually, I'll just map all the reads to the genomes from that clade because I have a pretty good idea of what genes are in, or should be in those genomes already. So why would I start from scratch? So that's, and so that's the uh, second tier here, so the pan genome. So again, after figuring out what clades are there, it'll take the genomes from those clades and do a similarity search against just those genomes. So typically, this is a smaller subset of your data. And then depending on how well characterized you, your environment is, uh, you might not have too many reads mapping here. So if you're working with human data, typically you see something like 50% of your reads um, mapping at this step. Um, and then so the final step is sort of a more brute force approach of just, say, okay, I'm just going to take all of these known UNRF protein sequences and I'm just going to do a translated search of all of my reads against all of these, this whole UNRF database. And so you're doing a comparison against millions of protein families. And so because you're screening out a lot of the reads at this step, uh, there's fewer reads that have to be input here. So this can run a lot faster. Anyway, so those are the three major steps. Does anyone have any questions about that? Uh, so uh, one of the major um, outputs of HUMAN2, because you have done this taxonomic pre-screen, you've done the mapping to the pan genomes, for at least a subset of your data, you can get these taxonomic contributions. So uh, the methods that Laura will be talking about, well, actually, be, so that if we're talking about genome assembly, you get very, much more direct uh, ideas about what genes are in each genomes. But this, the idea here is that, okay, I, I mapped the reads to these pan genomes. I know what genes are within each of these genomes. Uh, so if, there, if a read mapped here, then I, you can kind of interpret it as, okay, the species is contributing that gene to the community. And so the idea would be rather than just looking at uh, just like the, the relative abundance of individual genes, you'd be looking at, uh, okay, you could say, okay, this genus is contributing about 20 copies of this gene. A different genus is contributing another 20 copies. So uh, you, you get a very different story about um, how the functions are being contributed across your samples. So for instance, if you're comparing the last three with the first three here. So typically if you're using HUMAN2, uh, the vast majority of the, of the gene families that you'd identify are unclassified. So they'd only be identified at this last step here. So they wouldn't, you wouldn't have a taxonomic link. But uh, by using this uh, contribu contributional data, you can actually get some novel insights 
Uh, so the overall pipeline for Human 2 is shown here. So uh, sort of just highlights some of the things I was just talking about. So again, uh, so the quality controlled reads are input to Metaflan 2 with these clade specific marker genes. So you get your list of what organisms are there. Uh, and then so once you figure out what organisms are there, you just map the reads only to the genomes for those organisms. And so again, that's for this, the Chocoflan database has this database of genomes. Uh, so then you get, <clears throat> uh, so the gene hits for specific organisms. And then so you put that aside, you save that for later, and then you proceed if all the reads that didn't map. And if all the reads that didn't map, you do this translated search. So uh, you'd, you'd be going against a protein database now. So that's with diamond. And they say Uniref 50 here. So that'd be clustering the protein sequences at 50%. Uh, a lot of people use 90%, which is what I tend to use a few months too. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a somewhat arbitrary choice. They were originally suggesting you use Uniref 50. They've recently switched to Uniref 90. And I, I think the jury's a little out on what database would be better to use. Either way, like I mentioned, like I showed before, uh, the vast majority of these proteins are going to be species specific, or at least clay, like genus specific. And so it's important to keep that in mind when you're doing, using this approach. Uh, so then you get your hits to the protein families, uh, and then you can you can get uh, use Metapsych to get pathway abundances, and as we'll talk about in the lab, you can get pathway coverages as well. So how well covered the individual pathways are, and so these would be the three main outputs here. So they're stratified by the contributing organ or, organism where uh, where it's possible. So the output files will look like this. So we'll, we can talk about these in the lab. So you'll be making these output files in just a few minutes. Uh, so yeah, so again, you'll have uh, the abundance of individual gene families, so like Uniref 90 gene families, which has this ID. There would be the community-wide abundance of this gene family, so that's shown here. And then if they show the little pipe, that means that they're showing it broken down by what species is contributing the gene abundance. And then there's a similar output for pathway abundance too, so this is metapsych pathways. And then so you get the abundance and also the coverage of how well those pathways are covered. Uh, and yeah, so just a, this is originally made as a motivating uh, example for why you'd want to use contributional data. And um, so it's, these are sort of uh, cherry-picked examples of cool cases of where if you had, didn't have contributional data of which, which species were contributing the functions, you might be missing, you might be totally misinterpreting the data. And so by having this information about which species are contributing the uh, uh, the genes or the pathways in this case, uh, you can you can distinguish this case where the pathway tends to be a very similar relative abundance across all the samples, which are on the x-axis here, these 76 human microbiome stool samples. So it tends to be very highly conserved, and it tends to be mainly uh, contributed by one organism. In contrast, if you didn't have this data, you might not be able to distinguish that from a case where it's still very highly conserved across uh, the samples but uh, it tends to be contributed by very different organisms. So there'd be a different interpretation about how that pathway is being contributed in, that, in these different environments. And then so there are other examples too where it might be just extremely variable across um, samples and also not consistent, not uh, similar relative abundance and so forth. So by using this contributional data, you can sort of distinguish these scenarios and get more insight to what's contributing a, a function in your community. So that's the real benefit of this approach. But again, um, I just want to emphasize this isn't the only way to analyze this kind of data. And so the next module will be talking about different approaches as well. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to show. And uh, if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to help you out. I guess the, we have half an hour before the fire drill. So we can get started in the lab. <clears throat> so, yep. Uh, talking about centrifuge versus Kraken. Uh, are there benefits to one or the other beyond the computing requirements? So if you have the ability to run Kraken? That's a good question. Um, so actually, in the Centrifuge paper, they do compare uh, precision and specificity of Kraken. And so, uh, so it's very similar accuracy compared to Kraken. Um, so it does have higher sensitivity and slightly lower precision, but they're very similar. Um, and so I think probably if you were able to run Kraken, it still might be better to run Centrifuge just because 
if you're okay doing the pro post processing of centrifuges output because again centrifuges approach is kind of just like give you all the information then you have to figure out what you want to make of it so again like for one read it'll say it matches five different genomes and so you have to really post process that and whereas Kraken will do one output so um, yeah how you dealt with that output data could really change your results so I would use centrifuge but you'd have to do some testing to figure out how to post process it can these approaches be used with the nanopore data? Um, I haven't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with that kind of data, so I'm not, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I think they should be able to, but typically they're used with quite short reads. Um, so, yeah, I don't, uh, I think probably that's more applicable for the next module. Mm -hmm.